the College of Complexes. Everybody hear me? All right. Radio's not working. Tonight, we are going to hear about string theory and how it may be a concept of God. Some of it's God, anyway. Uh, aside from that, we have announcements to begin with. We will be followed by our speaker, Doug Bashir, who will tell us about string theory and concepts of God. And then we will have your questions to the speaker, who will respond to them one way or another. And uh, that is followed around 10 o'clock by uh, your rebuttals, your information and opinions, and questions uh, too. No. All right. Anything else? Any other announcements? <coughs> going, going, gone. All right. Without further ado, we will hear from Mr. Woodard about string theory and concepts of God. All right. Come on, Dubs. No. <laughs> Okay, I believe I am uh, addressing this fine group uh, for the fourth time over the years. And uh, I was passing out a handout. Uh, most of you, as you came in, is there anyone that does not have a handout? Okay. Uh, we're going to be having a, a uh, DVD uh, presentation of uh, what Brian Green did on PBS a few years back called The Elegant Universe. And before we get into that, I wanted to give you a little background of some of the things that you're going to be seeing in the video. Um, some of the things will be seen in the video uh, regarding string theory uh, that, um, so that you can get acquainted with it in short order. Um, one of the things about string theory is that it's supposed to be the theory of everything uh, that says here in the, the first page of the handout I got, gave you. String theory thereby unravels the central Gordian knot of contemporary theoretical physics. It uh, resolves the incompatibility between quantum mechanics and general relativity. And uh, if you look at the figure there, um, it goes, uh, there's an explanation below the figure, uh, figure 1.1 says matter is composed of atoms. Which, which in turn are made from quarks and electrons. According to string theory, all such particles are actually tiny loops of vibrating string. So in all things, they're saying, and you'll see this in the video, is strings are, are the basic components of all matter. And then and they're built up uh, to the more solid particles. You know, and you can see that uh, the electrons lead to the atoms, and the atoms eventually get to your apple there. So that's kind of basic for uh, what they're going to be showing you in the video, or in the DVD. The second page in 
is a, a, a picture at the top. It says new dimensions and strings. And I, I identified uh, in, the, in the string uh, there are six dimensions. And then uh, they also consider time to be a dimension. And they talk about three spatial dimensions which we experience here on Earth. Um, namely, they have them listed there left and right, back and forth, up and down. And then uh, later in the DVD, uh, they're going to bring out a concept of a brain. And brain is short for membrane. And a membrane is a fabric of the universe that can stretch for odd infinitum. Uh, and then that's how they get to uh, 11 dimensions. And uh, the figure that you have uh, kind of looks like a wishbone there in the picture. But actually, uh, to the right there, with the, what's encircled, is a small area of what you're looking at. Uh, uh, in uh, st uh, string dimensions. And the reason, I don't know, I, I, was, I was trying to think of something to, to show you that you could relate to as, as far as, you know, how you can get more dimensions. And I was thinking of straws. If anybody has a straw at their table, they can look at it as I say this. Okay, you have a straw and you have a certain length. Okay, and the, cer the straw has a certain height. But then within the straw, if you were an ant, uh, you could circle within the straw, or you could circle around outside the straw. And that's, uh, that's one of the things uh, they talk a lot about in the uh, DVD, are the dimensions. The, 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 you can't always see these dimensions, but in terms of their thinking and consistent with their theory, they're there. Now, uh, at the bottom there, on the bottom right, uh, there are essentially two kinds of string shapes. The, the one is called an open string. And uh, in the DVD, he'll talk about electromagnetism. And an open string can attach itself uh, to uh, a surface. And so, and then, and then he'll go on later and he'll talk about gravitons, which essentially are closed strings, and they can float. So, uh, he, he'll, uh, if we get to that point, we'll, we'll see uh, him talking about uh, gravity, sort of as being described as the weak force, and then uh, the string, open string, is being like a magnet, stronger. Uh, but there, there's a reason uh, uh, for you know uh, gravity not being uh, uh, tied to the Earth, that it can float through space. Uh, that's one of the things he brings out. Uh, then. Uh, the third page in, uh, you have uh, what looks like a trampoline or uh, a, a, a rubber fabric, and you have, that's, that's figure 3.5, that's the Earth. And the Earth uh, orbits around the Sun, and the Sun is sits in the middle there, and what they're getting at is, uh, it says, they talk about the path of least resistance, and that's really uh, Einstein's uh, general relativity uh, principle. And uh, so, in other words, uh, as it says here, uh, Einstein's description of gravity, the more massive an object is, the greater the distortion it causes in the surrounding space. This implies that the more massive an object, the greater the gravitational influence it can exert on other bodies precisely in accordance with our experiences. Just as the distortion of the rubber membrane due to the bowling ball gets smaller as one gets farther from it, the amount of spatial warping due to a, due to a massive body 
uh, as the sun decreases, as one's distance from it increases. And then he talks about at the bottom there about how the, the moon uh, uh, is influenced by the Earth's uh, gravity and, and affects the lunar orbit. So, uh, <clears throat> so again, uh, this whole concept of fabric of space keeps coming up uh, in the DVD. And it's uh, essential to the understanding string theory. And also in the string theory, he'll touch on uh, a wormhole. Any one of you that watched uh, Deep Space Nine uh, may be familiar with the wormhole. It's a way of getting from one side of the universe to the other. Uh, it's sort of a bridge. Uh, provides a shortcut getting from one region of space to the other. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, one thing is that uh, Einstein uh, uh, did not allow for tearing of a fabric of uh, the universe. And so uh, wormholes weren't possible under his theory. But um, uh, as we shall see, you know, uh, with the string theory, there it may be a possibility uh, to exist uh, within the, the fabric of the strings. And in the last page, I threw in uh, the black hole. Uh, we won't really talk about the black hole uh, in the DVD, but I just thought I'd put it in there uh, as that uh, black holes, are, again, are, it's uh, basically it's the uh, residue of a, a star that has died, uh, lights out, and uh, its mass is so large that it falls through the fabric of space. And as it says there in the description, that light cannot escape, and anything that comes in there is doomed to fall into the pit or the black hole. Um, so uh, I guess the, one of the things is we cannot see black holes, uh, but uh, their so observers, the astronomers have felt uh, from the uh, observing the behavior of stars and planets out uh, in space, uh, that there uh, there's a possibility that they do exist. Okay, so I guess I'll get Tim, and we'll start the video. Are we at the dim uh, house lights? No, do, I think we'll be okay. We're going to leave them on? Okay. All right, dim them then. Get them dimmed. What do you dim them? Solution. 
motion is strings. Tiny bits of energy vibrating like the strings on a cello. A cosmic symphony at the heart of all reality. But it comes at a price. Parallel universes and 11 dimensions. Most of which you've never seen. We really may live in a universe with more dimensions than meet the eye. People who've said that there are extra dimensions of space have been labeled crackpots or people who are bananas. A mirage of science and mathematics? Or the ultimate theory of everything? The string theory fails to provide a testable prediction that nobody should believe in. Is that a theory of physics? Or philosophy? One thing that is certain is that string theory is already showing us that the universe may be a lot stranger than any of us ever imagined. Coming up tonight, the undeniable pull of strings. The atmosphere was electric. String theory goes through a revolution of its own. Five different string theories and reveals the new shape of things to come. Perhaps we live on a three-dimensional membrane. Our universe might be like a slice of bread. We're trapped on just a tiny slice of the higher dimensional universe. <laughs> That's actually a problem. Watch the elegant universe right now. things that we'll get into a little more detail later uh, when he was talking about the universes you know being uh, like a uh, slice of bread uh, I guess physicists re uh, refer to that as a bulk and uh, one of the things uh, that uh, the problem is is that as much as universes may be out there uh, but because we're attached uh, by strings to our own universe. We cannot uh, experience other universes. Uh, the other thing uh, he uh, pointed out uh, was that the, the string uh, is the theory has the potential to be the, the theory of everything. They sometimes call it as to T O E uh, and um, what it, what it is, is there's four forces uh, in uh, physics uh, that string uh, theory covers. But one force uh, is the, uh, the gravity, the laws of gravity. The second uh, force is electromagnetism. The uh, third uh, force is what they call the strong force, or the atomic, that uh, you know, you have the uh, nucleus of the atom, uh, and you know, protons and neutrons. And then uh, the uh, weak force is uh, is, is the uh, force. Uh, you know, what they talk a lot about is the decay of uh, radioactive material. That it starts as one element, and then as it loses electrons that it decays to other elements uh, in the periodic table. And so those four forces are the, the, the forces that are combined uh, by string theory. And we're going to continue with the PVD, I guess. Can you find blue sky? 
Outside were the electrons, and inside were protons and neutrons, which were made up of quarks. But string theory says that what we thought were indivisible particles are actually tiny vibrating strings. It is nothing really mystical. It's a really tiny string. It either closes into its little circle or it has endpoints, but it's just a little string. In the 1980s, the idea caught on, and people started jumping on the string bandwagon. Well, the fact that suddenly all these other people were working in the field had its advantages and its disadvantages. It was wonderful to see how rapidly the subject could develop now, because so many people were working on it. One of the great attractions of strings is their versatility. Just as the strings on a cello can vibrate at different frequencies, making all the individual musical notes, in the same way, the tiny strings of string theory vibrate and dance in different patterns, creating all the fundamental particles of nature. If this view is right, then put them all together and we get the grand and beautiful symphony that is our universe. What's really exciting about this is that it offers an amazing possibility. If we could only master the rhythms of strings, then we'd stand a good chance of explaining all the matter and all the forces of nature, from the tiniest subatomic particles to the galaxies of outer space. of string theory to be a unified theory of everything. Now, I know that. Here we go again. It's been more than 300 years. This is Ed Witten. He's widely 
regarded as one of the world's greatest living physicists, perhaps even Einstein's successor. Ed Witten is a very special person in the field. He clearly has a grasp, particularly of the underlying mathematical principles, which is far greater than most other people. Well, you know, we all think we're very smart. He's so much smarter than the rest of us. In 1995, string theorists from all over the world gathered at the University of Southern California for their annual conference. Ed Witten showed up at Strings 95 and rocked their world. I was really trying to think of something that would be significant for the occasion. And actually, since five string theories was too many, I thought I would try to get rid of some of them. <coughs> To solve the problem, Witten constructed a spectacular new way of looking at string theory. Ed announced that he had thought about it, and moreover he had solved it. He was going to tell us the solution to every string theory in every dimension, which was an enormous claim. But coming from Ed, it was not so surprising. The atmosphere was electric because all of a sudden, string theory, which had been going through kind of doldrums, was given an incredible boost, a shot in the arm. Ed Witten gave his famous lecture, and he said a couple of words that got me interested. And for the rest of the lecture, I got hooked up on the first few words that he said and completely missed the point of, uh, of his lecture. I remember that I had to give the talk after him, and I was kind of embarrassed. <laughs> Ed Witten just blew everybody away. Ed Witten blew everybody away because he provided a completely new perspective on string theory. From this point of view, we could see that there weren't really five different theories. Like reflections in a wall of mirrors, what we thought were five theories turned out to be just five different ways of looking at the same thing. String theory was unified at last. Witten's work sparked a breakthrough so revolutionary that it was given its own name, M-theory, although no one really knows what the M stands for. Ah, uh, what is the M for? M-theory. 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 M-theory is a theory. Yes. Uh, I don't actually know what the M stands for. Well, the M has... I've heard many descriptions. Mystery theory, magic theory. It's the mother theory, matrix theory. Monstrous theory. I don't know what, I don't know what it meant. M stands for magic, mystery, or matrix, according to taste. I suspect that the M is an upside down W for Witten. Some cynics have occasionally suggested that M may also stand for murky, because our level of understanding of the theory is in fact so primitive. Maybe I shouldn't have told you that one. <laughs> Whatever the name, it was a bombshell. Suddenly, everything was different. There was a lot of panic, if you like, realizing that big things were happening and, and all of us not wanting to get left behind in this new revolution of string theory. <laughs> After Witten's talk, there was renewed hope that this one theory could be the theory to explain everything in the universe. But there was also a price to pay. Before M-theory, strings seemed to operate in a world with 10 dimensions. These included one dimension of time, the three familiar space dimensions, as well as six extra dimensions, curled up so tiny that they're completely invisible. But we think these extra dimensions exist because they come out of the equations of string theory. Strings need to move in more than three dimensions. And that was a shock to everybody, but then we learned to live with it. But M-theory would go even further, demanding yet another spatial dimension, bringing the grand total to 11 dimensions. We know that there will have to be 11 dimensions for this theory to make sense. So there must be 11 dimensions we only see three plus one of them. How is that possible? For most of us, 
it's virtually impossible to picture the extra higher dimensions. I can't. And it's not surprising. Our brains evolve sensing just the three spatial dimensions of everyday experience. So how can we get a feel for them? One way is to go to the movies. familiar with the real world having three spatial dimensions. That is, anywhere I go, I can move left, right, back, forth, or up, down. But in the movies, things are a bit different. Even though the characters on a movie screen look three-dimensional, they actually are stuck in just two dimensions. There is no back, forth on a movie screen. That's just an optical illusion. To really move in the back-forth dimension, I'd have to step out of the screen. And sometimes, moving into a higher dimension can be a useful thing to do. So, dimensions all have to do with the independent directions in which you can move. They're sometimes called degrees of freedom. The more dimensions or degrees of freedom you have, the more you can do. That's right. And if there really are 11 dimensions, then strings can do a lot more, too. People found fairly soon that there were objects that lived in these theories, which weren't just strings, but were larger than that. They actually looked like membranes or surfaces. The extra dimension Witten added allows a string to stretch into something like a membrane, or a brain for short. A brain could be three-dimensional, or even more. And with enough energy, a brain could grow to an enormous size, perhaps even as large as a universe. This was a revolution in string theory. String theory has gotten much more Baroque. I mean, now there are not only strings, there are membranes. People go on calling the string theory, but uh, the string theorists are not sure it really is a theory of strings anymore. The existence of giant membranes and extra dimensions would open up a startling new possibility. That our whole universe is living on a membrane inside a much larger, higher dimensional space. It's almost as if we were living inside a loaf of bread. might be like a slice of bread, just one slice in a much larger loaf that physicists sometimes call the bulk. And if these ideas are right, the bulk may have other slices, other universes that are right next to ours, in effect, parallel universes. Not only would our universe be nothing special, but we could have a lot of neighbors. Some of them could resemble our universe. They might have matter and planets and, who knows, maybe even beings of a sort. Others could certainly be a lot stranger. They might be ruled by completely different laws of physics. Now, all of these other universes would exist within the extra dimensions of M-theory, dimensions that are all around us. Some even say they might be right next to us, less than a millimeter away. But if that's true, why can't I see them or touch them? If you have a brain living in a higher dimensional space and, you, and your particles, your atoms, cannot get off the brain, it's like trying to reach out, but you can't touch anything. It might as well be on the other end of the universe. And it's a very powerful idea, because if it's right, 
it means that our whole picture of the universe is clouded by the fact that we're trapped on just a tiny slice of the higher dimensional universe. It is a powerful idea, especially because it may help solve one of the great mysteries of modern science. It has to do with gravity. It's been more than 300 years since Isaac Newton came up with the universal law of gravity, inspired, as the story goes, by seeing an apple fall from a tree. Today, it seems obvious that gravity is a powerful force. It would seem to most people that gravity is a very important force. It's very strong. It's very hard to get up in the morning, stand up, and when things fall, they break because gravity is strong. The fact of the matter is that it's not strong. It's, it's really a, a very weak force. Gravity pulls us down to the Earth and keeps our Earth in orbit around the Sun. But in fact, we overcome the force of gravity all the time. It's not that hard. Even with the gravity of the entire Earth pulling this apple downward, the muscles in my arm can easily overcome it. And it's not just our muscles that put gravity to shame. Magnets can do it too, no sweat. Magnets carry a different force, the electromagnetic force. That's the same force behind light and electricity. It turns out that electromagnetism is much, much stronger than gravity. Gravity, in comparison, is amazingly weak. How weak? The electromagnetic force is some thousand, billion, 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 billion times stronger. That's a one with 39 zeros following it. <coughs> the weakness of gravity has confounded scientists for decades. But now, with the radical world of string theory filled with membranes and extra dimensions, there's a whole new way to look at the problem. One way of approaching the question of why gravity is so weak compared to all the other forces is to turn the question completely on its head and say, no, actually, gravity isn't very weak compared to all the other forces. It just appears to be weak. <coughs> it may be that gravity is actually just as strong as electromagnetism, but for some reason, we can't feel its strength. Consider a pool table, a very large pool table. Think of the surface of the pool table as representing our three-dimensional universe, although it is just two-dimensional. And think of the billiard balls as representing atoms and other particles that the universe is made out of. So here's the wild idea. The atoms and particles that make up stuff in the world around us will stay on our particular membrane, our slice of the universe, just as the billiard balls will stay on the surface of the pool table. Yep. Unless you're a really bad pool player. But whenever the balls collide, there is something that always seeps off the table. Sound waves. That's why I can hear the collision. The idea is that gravity might be like the sound waves. It might not be confined to our membrane. It might be able to seep off our part of the universe. Or think about it another way. Instead of pool tables, let's go back to bread. Imagine that our universe is like this slice of toast. And that you and me and all of matter, light itself, everything we see is like jelly. Now, jelly can move freely on the surface of the toast, but otherwise it's stuck. It can't leave the surface itself. But what if gravity were different? What if gravity were more like cinnamon and sugar? Now, this stuff isn't sticky at all, so it easily slides right off the surface. But 
why would gravity be so different from everything else that we know of in the universe? Well, it turns out that string theory, or M theory, provides an answer. It all has to do with shape. For years, we concentrated on strings that were closed loops, like rubber bands. But after M theory, we turned our attention to other kinds. Now we think that everything we see around us, like matter and light, is made of open-ended strings. And the ends of each string are tied down to our three-dimensional membrane. But closed loops of string do exist. And one kind is responsible for gravity. It's called a graviton. With closed loops, there are no loose ends to tie down, so gravitons are free to escape into the other dimensions, diluting the strength of gravity and making it seem weaker than the other forces of nature. This suggests an intriguing possibility. If we do live on a membrane and there are parallel universes on other membranes near us, we may never see them. But perhaps we could one day feel them through gravity. If there happens to be intelligent life on one of the membranes, then this intelligent life might be very close to us. So theoretically and purely theoretically, we might be able to communicate with this intelligent life by exchanging strong gravity wave sources. So who knows, maybe someday we'll develop the technology and use gravity waves to actually communicate with other worlds. Are you here? Yeah, hey, it's Brian. How you doing? Brian. We don't really know if parallel universes could have a real impact on us. But there is one very controversial idea which said they've already played a major role. In fact, it gives them credit for our existence. All right. All right, we're good. Okay. Thank you for your patience. My aunt. You're on. Thank you. Exactly. Get lights. My boss is in.
elements back uh, to what they consider the beginning of time uh, in their model. And uh, one thing they found out was that their laws of physics, uh, calculations, there's a lot of calculating behind these uh, theories, by the way, uh, didn't hold up. And, uh, you know, someone uh, came on and said, you know, uh, how, how, how can you uh, have something uh, coming out of nothing? Which is a little bit opposed to uh, theological thought, but uh, the point in, he was trying to make is that in order to wind up with something, you have to have something to start with. So one of the things... Uh, they advanced in the, uh, the DVD, which you did not see, was that, uh, that theoretically they had uh, raised the possibility of brains colliding in, in the beginning of the universe. And uh, that would be enough uh, to have uh, particles spewing uh, throughout the universe. And uh, if and then they, if it uh, happened again, I guess the, uh, there could be a big fiery mass. Uh, one of the things they uh, also talked about, which we didn't show, uh, was that uh, of uh, having rips and tears uh, in the fabric of the universe. As I said earlier, uh, Einstein did not allow for that. Uh, in his theories, uh, wormholes were not possible. But uh, as Michael Green, the, our uh, host in the, in the, the DVD, uh, indicated uh, that uh, uh, <clears throat> that the uh, rips and the, the tears uh, could be healed by tubular strings. Uh, but again, all this is uh, theoretical. In fact, uh, at the end, you, there was, what I wanted to show was uh, some of the comments for, from the uh, experts about string theory and that uh, it's, it's a theory, it's uh, not totally proven, and one of the big things is that it cannot be tested. So if, uh, you know, science requires testing. So uh, basically, uh, one fellow said, if it's not science, it's philosophy. So uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I really, uh, the first time I saw this video on uh, Channel 11, I was uh, really uh, taken in by it. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, now we only looked at the second disc, uh, which was titled The Eleventh Dimension. Uh, there, there's a, it comes in a two disc uh, uh, package. And I didn't show any of the first disc, which was, you know, all the elementary stuff leading up to uh, string theory. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, part of the, uh, the lecture, my presentation. Uh, in thinking about uh, string theory and God, um, there are a couple of things that they share in common. Uh, 
one uh, item is you can't really test for God. Um, just like string theory, you know, uh, God's presence is a matter of belief. Uh, the other uh, is is that you know, uh, based on uh, not having being able to test string theory, um, uh, when its existence is dependent on uh, your faith uh, uh, in the uh, the theory, because it's not provable as of yet. Now there may be a time when they may be able to prove it, you know, they went into uh, a lot of the stuff that goes on at Fermi, the uh, collide, uh, colliders, the super colliders, and, and then they have one over uh, in Europe and Switzerland, CERN, uh, where uh, they, they send the atoms around and they look for some of these particles uh, to be uh, present, you know, uh, which would help to prove uh, you know, some of the uh, hypothesis of string theory. But uh, yeah, also the, the, that leads to the, the third uh, commonality uh, between God and string theory is they cannot be readily proven. Um, but at any rate, um, <laughs> So, uh, the, uh, the arguments for the existence of God are, are uh, the, well, one argument is the argument for an unmoved mover. There's another argument uh, for the possibility and necessity for God. But the, the argument I, I think I focused on most is the argument for the uncaused cause. And in St. Thomas Aquinas' arguments, everything has a cause. If every cause itself has a cause. But you cannot have an infinite number of causes. Therefore, there must be an uncaused cause which causes everything to happen without itself being caused by anything else. And such an uncaused cause is what people understand by God. Now in this book, uh, Show Me God, uh, they, they took it a little further uh, in regards to the cause. Uh, the, the, quote, the first cause must be independent of its effect. God must be transcendent, that is, above and beyond the boundaries of his creation. At Eastern religions, thinking the supreme soul or the infinite is taught to be the place where one sees nothing but unity. The second cause must be, the second element of the first cause must be the infinitely powerful or the omnipotent. The first cause had to be limited because if it were unlimited, it would have to be limited by some other thing. And it can be not be limited by nothing. A third uh, argument is the first cause must be eternal, transcending time. The creator must exist outside of time. Nothing in the universe can go back before the creation event. But the Creator must start the process. He is without beginning or end. He simply is. I am of the Hebrew Bible. And uh, you remember Moses on the mountain, you know, when he asked God, uh, who are you? God, uh, he wanted to know, well, how should I tell the Israelites? Uh, God replied, I am who am. Tell them uh, I am sent. Uh, the first cause must be spiritual, traveling, uh, transcending space. The first cause must be beyond the four dimensions of our space-time, but it may interact with them. Jesus emphasized that God is spirit and must be 
worshipped in spirit, the Judeo-Christian idea of a deity out of the universe was a unique concept among the world's early religions. Another cause is the first cause must be all-knowing, omniscient. In recent history, humans have only begun to appreciate the complexities of the atom, of DNA, and of the symmetry and harmony of nature's laws. Einstein said, the harmony of natural law reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. Nature's laws work together with tremendous precision. And uh, one of the things uh, that I, I always think of this uh, whenever I watch some of these programs is when they talk about ecology, how uh, in certain regions nature fits together, you know, the trees and, and the flowers and the water and the animals that live uh, in that area. You know, uh, they, uh, they're they more sensitive, I guess, uh, to uh, the way uh, nature uh, it seems to, to kind of fit in, in a logical order, you know, after it's uh, studied for a while. And then uh, finally we have the first cause must have personhood. Purpose is perhaps the most important attribute of personhood. For the grand desire, designer to bring about intelligent life in the universe. So, uh, those are uh, basically, you know, uh, an approach, uh, I guess, uh, an apologetic approach, uh, a defense of, you know, uh, uh, of God being uh, creator of the universe. You know, as Catholics, uh, we, uh, we, every Sunday we have this uh, Nicene Creed where we recite in the first paragraph, is I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is visible, which is seen, and invisible, unseen. And, you know, I pulled together some quotes from the Bible, uh, which uh, I think uh, I tried to relate them uh, to the... Uh, uh, string theory, in that uh, uh, that God would uh, seemingly, you know, it was, it was I would say be odd things, uh, you know, uh, one 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 thing that came out uh, from Isaiah uh, that I want to share with you. It, it's in the fifty-fifth chapter. And this is recorded, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. So, you know, uh, in a way, if you think about the string theory, that, you know, uh, we have multiple uni uh, universes, and uh, where we got God saying that He's not like us, you know. Uh, in, in John, it says, uh, He says, "Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do not know that when it is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is." Uh, I don't know what uh, ultimately we will what our vision of God will be. Uh, will it be a, a giant brain at the end of the universe? There were all these, uh, as you saw in the picture, all these uh, strings were floating around uh, through the cosmos. And I was wondering, you know, if they were all emanating, you know, uh, from God uh, at the end of the universe. And uh, here we have uh, 
Now, one of the things we didn't show you uh, in the video was that he had, uh, he was talking about, um, uh, I guess, uh, universes or being able to switch uh, uh, through a, through a wormhole uh, between verse universes, and it was one where this is really got my attention as far as trying to approach this uh, string theory as God related because he 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 uh, has a picture where he goes back goes through a wormhole and he comes out and he's on skis with skiers and and they have a year listed as 1937. You know he's doing this in. 1990, and it, it uh, just kind of struck me because, you know, we uh, we say that uh, in Scripture too. You know, uh, for the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. Uh, that's in Peter, uh, but uh, that uh, really got, caught my attention. That you know, you could go back in time. And, even though we can't go back in time, you know, maybe, you know, it's possible in the universe there may be a, a wormhole to go back in time. Uh, and then he went forward in time, and then he was like, he could be in China, and then he was uh, up in Russia, and then he came back to Manhattan or whatever. And it was sort of interesting to see him whip around like that. Uh, uh, I don't know if... Uh, that will be our uh, good fortune in the hereafter. Um, and then, uh, as far as the presence of God, you know, like strings, in Matthew it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a small coin? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your Father's knowledge. Even all the hairs of your head are counted. Now somebody told me that there that even today they can extract that gene and find out uh, how many hairs you are going to have or get in your lifetime. But I thought that was uh, always interesting that God would know that much detail about what's going on on earth here. Um, the other thing, uh, as far as uh, our uh, life with God, and John, it says, In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I, Jesus, have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? So, you know, Scripture uh, has a lot of interesting references uh, for uh, the God theory. Uh, but I've got a couple of things here I want to share with you. Um, I, th I want to thank you for your patience and watching the DVD because uh, uh, we, we tried to have it run smoother, but uh, we had a few quirks there. But uh, you all seem to be interested in it. Uh, I was looking about, so I hope that was the case. Um, Here. Okay. Uh, one, uh, you know, regards. Uh, these are some comments uh, related to string theory made by others uh, about Christian belief. Uh, to me, uh, this was from an article, uh, "The Christ of the Klingons." A physicist and a philosopher envision God's design in the beautiful equations of string and M-theory. And it says, uh, to me, M-theory offers a Christian God whose creative ability is much larger than we ever could imagine before. Uh, then here we have uh, a new theory, a uh, single theory arose called M-theory, which remains so sketchy that theorists don't agree on what the M stands for. It might be membrane. As you recall in, in the, the uh, DVD, uh, there was uh, magical matrix, mystery, and then one was murky. And then someone said the M really stood for the guy that developed the theory, Witten, an M, which is an upside down W. 
but it, it, they say here, uh, as a theory of everything, M theory is the best chance scientists have for arriving for a complete picture of the universe. Our entire universe, planets, stars, great walls, are just a bubble on an ocean of existence covered with, with many more like it. If the laws, uh, universe uh, arose from the laws of physics, those who designed the laws, uh, why does the universe uh, work the way it does? Trying to apply science to the God question is where science are way overstepping their area of competence. Uh, God uh, is the primary fundamental uh, source and prov the provider of the laws of physics is, uh, is secondary. Well, I mean, multiverse is distinct variety, unending moments of new creation, and perhaps infinite scope makes sense as the work of God of infinites who creates eternally. Um, have any of you uh, read C.S. Lewis or seen the Chronicles of Narnia? Uh, you know that in, in those stories uh, there was depictions of a multi-universe. You know that one girl Lucy stepped through a, a closet into another world. We have God in, uh, did create multiple universes. He likely populated more than one. And then uh, they have here uh, God, uh, the Son, being infinite as he could take on, and here they say, the Klingon nature, the Klingon version of Jesus. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, uh, I, I always, you know, I always like the Star Trek theory because, uh, program, because, you know, a lot of these things, uh, they kind of had for granted, you know, parallel universes, uh, they had, uh, a, friend, a lot of science programs, uh, take advantage of that. And, uh, they had uh, changeling characters, remember Deep Space Nine? Uh, the one guy would always be different uh, depending on what episode you were watching. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, has had a conference on the possibility of life elsewhere in the universe. Um, and then uh, a large number of scientists doubt that M theory is anything more than a collection of fascinating but fictional equations, and even if M, if M theory doesn't isn't correct, that doesn't guarantee a multi. Or if it is correct, I'm sorry, it doesn't guarantee a multi-universe. Uh, okay, Doug, let's. Uh, right. So, uh, I guess you know the to, to buy into all this. I guess you know. Uh, it takes a leap of faith uh, oh. <laughs> to, uh, I mean, uh, we, but uh, doing, uh, doing a defense of beliefs, uh, they call this apologetics, but they say, you know, the, the, the conversion uh, uh, to, uh, to a believer is basically uh, a change of heart. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, oh, uh, hang on. Let's uh, ask, a ask a question. <laughs> all right, all right. My, first, my question is now, you're, in your handout here and also in the program, they talked about, according to the most recent theories, that, that, that the universe actually has 11 dimensions. Yes. Now, those dimensions being, first of all, there are the three dimensions of space that we know. Spatial, right. Right. And then there's, well, you know, left, right, up, down, and forward, back. And then there's the one dimension of time. So that's four dimensions total. Now, dimension number five, the membranes. It's, that's listed in your handout here. And that leaves six other dimensions unaccounted for. Can you tell me, what are those other six dimensions? Well, if you, if you look at the wishbone figure. Uh, the wishbone, okay. 
Oh, okay. I so mean, the, 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 the little the, circles the, within the, them. Yeah, I, okay. I, I don't know if you heard me earlier, but I said, you know, consider. Uh, <coughs> Everybody hear me? I got so a little over this, this, this wishbone figure represents the six dimensions. Well, so which, well I got them numbered there, one, two, three, one okay, to six. I see that. I see that. But, <laughs> you know, it's like this. I said to for everyone, if you have a straw at your table, which I can see you don't. <laughs> but at any rate, if you had a straw, you know what a straw looks like. Okay, well, straw, straw to distance has length and a height, okay? Right. Okay, now, within the straw, yeah. Going around inside the straw, you have dimensions, ah. believe it or not. Okay. And that's what I'm showing in that figure. Okay. That's why, because it really wasn't, they, they're really hidden dimensions. Oh. But if you were an ant, they, they, they were saying that in the first video, DVD, that if you were an ant, you could experience those. If you could. Oh, okay get small enough to be in, you know. Now, the crazy thing is even, if you look to the right of what your, uh, that figure, right. you see a, a string-like thing with a circle around it. Yes. Now, where the circle is kind of represents what you're looking at. You know, that's how small it is. Okay. It's not why, it's, you know, this is, they, this is they sometimes idea. they use garden holes as an example, okay? So, you know, that's one of the, the strange things uh, about um, string theory, but the scientists have incorporated that into their theory, you know, to get to 11 dimensions. Okay, okay. And uh, the last one that it got added was the brain or the membrane. Right, at the right. end. Okay? I get that. Okay. All right. These other six are, those are, those are the six dimensions in which, in which these strings can exist. Is that what, so dimensions so within the strings? The dimensions within the strings. Okay. okay. Uh, okay. I, know, I don't know, Brown, are you supposed to be calling or am I? Yes. In that case, Sid, and then Sid Wesley, and then Michael. 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 According to that theory, can we go backward in time? Okay. Well, uh, I guess uh, if. Uh, if we had like a wormhole, uh, which he illustrated uh, in a part that we skipped over, uh, if we had that wormhole, yeah, we could get back to another uh, dimension of time, yeah, the past, I guess, yeah, because he, he took it back to, he had, he had on the screen 1937, I always remember that. Uh, that, that sort of caught my attention, but... Uh, but you know that's theoretical. That you no, of course. But, uh, oh. Wesley? Yeah. Uh, this representation of this Y that you show here yeah. is similar to when you do a relaxation exercise when you're doing Kundalini, and you are laying prone on the ground and you're imagining relaxing each yes. part of your body. You relax the feet. You come up. And you're more or less working with the inner side of, of yourself, not the external. Right. You see the connection? And then when your legs come together, you're relaxing your hips. But you're working with the inner part of yourself. And you're using the pineal gland, in a sense, to do this. Oh, okay. Well, that's more of a comment. But did you have a question about no, that? Or okay. Whether I got that idea from the exercise? I got this out of a book. Uh, I have it referenced the theory of almost everything. <laughs> but um, can I ask, is the string power empowered people to do anything? Uh, um, well, I think the scientists that are, uh, or the physicists that are involved with it, uh, I think they, uh, uh, you know, they they were talking about how they had five theories and they were a little disconcerted and you know, which one was the real theory, and then they had that Ed Witten uh, who came around with a developed M-theory, the brain. Um, so he, he brought them back and, uh, you know, and, and, and since they are now uh, reorientated uh, toward uh, finding uh, if uh, strength theory holds that, you know, they they uh, are watching the developments of the, like I said, the colliders, 
the Fermi Collider and the uh, CERN fly, uh, Collider over in Europe. Uh, they're watching those developments very closely uh, to see if, you know, they, they uh, would see uh, any uh, any uh, gravitons or they call it sometimes they have a new name, particles, which are real, supposed to be heavier elements that would fall out. Uh, but right now, as far as I know, there hasn't been any, but that doesn't say there never will be, I guess. I keep How does this God of the string theory tell me not to beat my wife? <laughs> uh, does God of the string theory do that? Oh, well, <laughs> how does he communicate to you? Well, I, 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 well, for that, you know, I, I always say this being a Catholic, uh, a Christian in a way, that I said, God speaks to us through Jesus. And so, you know, uh, Jesus says, uh, love, your, uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, there's several readings in uh, scripture, uh, and St. Paul writes, uh, you know, uh, without love, love is compassion, love is understanding, love never boasts, or something like that. So, uh, I guess that's how God communicates. Thank you, Somehow, Jesus and the string theory seem somewhat diverse. Uh, Just a little bit. Okay. Oh, okay. You know, it's it's uh, it's amazing, but the whole presentation on string theory kind of reminded me of somebody seeing visions and dreaming dreams, and that could be uh, much uh, facilitated by like hemp or acid or anything else. Uh, do you have any comments on that? <laughs> Tim. So, uh, so your your question for me is to ask the physicist or Michael Green, what have you been smoking lately? <laughs> Basically, yes, because that's what it sounds like. Uh, yeah, I, I guess you know, uh, like I said, uh, you know, uh, ideas, especially new ones, uh, can. Uh, Seem odd, you know, if uh, they've never been considered before, but, you know, there, there was a time where we thought that the Earth was the center of the universe, and the sun went around us, and then um, Copernicus and a few others proved us wrong. Galileo showed us that we really go around the sun, and uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, they, uh, they're, it's creative. Uh, it, it, like I said, you know, there, there is nothing really in place that explains everything. Now, I think for the Christian or the believer, I think you know, for them, you don't have to have all these proofs because you say, well, God created everything. You know, it's His world. You know, He. Uh, created the heavens and the earth and us and everything that's in it. Uh, but at the same time, the, 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 the physicists and the scientific community have to do this on proof. And uh, they can't uh, do it on conjecture. So uh, that's, that's one of the problems. Well, at least they feel that string theory uh, gives them an opening. Uh, I, I thought, in a way, that it was important to bring this up to the college, uh, to, to, in case you had heard about it or weren't totally sure, like I was until I saw the video. That's why I wanted to really share the video with you, is to, you know, that, uh, what this is all about. Oh. David Singer and then uh, Charles. I, I, I uh, didn't like that. I didn't quite grasp how the string theory proves the, might prove the existence of God. And then Doug, you yourself at the end fell, fell back on faith. You know, John Kierkegaard's statement, the leap of faith. Um, if you could say just a little bit more how the string theory might prove the existence of God. So, uh, <coughs> 
Well, I, I, I think the point I really wanted to make, uh, not so much to prove the existence of God, but that uh, God and string theory had commonalities. And one, both are not readily provable. Okay? So, uh, so belief in God, like I was saying at the end, is a matter of leap of faith. And, and then, uh, as far as string theory, I mean, uh, that's a, a, another thing. Uh, the, you, we didn't hear, hear it uh, from, the, from the DVD, but one of the scientists says, uh, you know, uh, if you can't prove it, you can't test it, it's philosophy. So, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it can, you know, uh, to a skeptic, they, they, they could easily uh, deny it. You say it's just uh, uh, using uh, mirrors, but uh, they feel that mathematically they've developed enough formulas that even if they don't have it totally right, they might have some of it right. All right, Charlie. Yeah, well, like the physicist said there, the universe is like a loaf of bread. And according to your method, you would go into the Bible and find some passage that said, oh, the earth is nourishing the wheat of life or something. You say there, see, is that your method? That this, wherever you find reference in scripture, you're just, what, a scientist is just uncovering what's already in the Bible? Um, well, I... When, when, he, when he was referring to the loaf of bread in the DVD, uh, he was trying to illustrate that the slices were like universes next to each other. Yeah. But, uh, but we couldn't touch them. You know, he went back and he, and he used the further example of, you know, he had the slices of toast. And he, on the one slice he smeared jelly. And then the other slice, he uh, dusted it with uh, cinnamon and sugar. Now, he's saying that, you know, there were, in my handout, there were, I told you there were, pointed out there were two kinds of strings, open strings and closed strings. Now, the open strings will attach themselves, so to speak, to the membrane of whatever universe you're living in. Okay? So what he was saying with the loaf was that if you're in one slice, one universe, you cannot get to the next universe because you're tied down by your by the string. But if you're a graviton, you may be able to float off to other universes. Um, so, uh, you know, that that's what the bread was about that he was talking about. Because you notice, remember he was slicing, each slice looked a lot different than the previous slice. Now, but when you get into the biblical sense of bread or uh, uh, Jesus' real presence in, in the Eucharist, now that's a different uh, area, but they're not, I wouldn't say they're related. If the, the Eucharist uh, proves that, you know, they're, they're connected to the universe. But, uh, but, but in a way, uh, the person of Jesus is very mysterious uh, to us that, that we knew he was among us, but then today, uh, we're being in heaven, we're, you know, could he be on another planet? Like I, I was saying, you know, could it be a Klingon planet? You know, sort of, I hate to use that term, I can't think, or uh, where have they got, the Ferengis or something? He could be a Ferengi. Uh, okay. It was Doug a deep Bankley. space nine. Doug, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, since um, superstring theory is so highly uh, mathematical and technical, uh, wouldn't that indicate uh, the character of God to be somewhat uh, geeky? And uh, aren't you uh, aren't you offended by this uh, notion of these uh, gravitons, uh, you know, huge numbers of them being lost from our space? It's like it's sort of, it's like the sperm that aren't able to uh, impregnate an egg. As a Catholic, doesn't that offend you that God would let all those gravitons escape? 
Well, as far as the, the graviton, uh, uh, you know, he did, he, the point he was trying to make was that, you know, compared to electromagnetism, uh, the force of a graviton on Earth, uh, even though it's a force, is not as strong uh, as the magnet. You know, and he picked up keys out of the sand, and then you know he was saying, you know, uh, I'll charge you three bucks. I, I can an apple falls to the ground, and I can pick it up and have no uh, exert no real effort uh, picking it up. You know, illustrating uh, gravity is, is a weak force, but um, but the thing the thing is is that you know he 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 also pointed out that. They, they changed their thinking on uh, strings. Well, in the beginning, and before M theory came along, they were looking at strings as uh, all strings being loops. But then, after M theory, now they're saying that uh, many of the strings are open strings, and uh, so the gravitons are, are free to go about and you know that's where you know he what was trying to get at that you know when you put uh, chili on the bread it stays you put on uh, uh, sugar and cinnamon it rolls off most of it so uh, I, I think there was another part of your question but uh, uh, you were saying about the geek I, did I, I don't know if I answered that either too all right. God is not a geek. <laughs> okay. Rob Lichtenberg. Uh, you're maintaining that God is necessary to create the super strings, but uh, why? Uh, I'd like to hear it. What are your reasons for thinking that the, the super strings themselves cannot always exist? Since matter cannot be created nor destroyed, according to the law of physics, conservation of energy. So why is God needed to create the super strength? Uh, well, that goes back uh, to what I was saying about uh, the un uh, cause and effect that God is the un That's a point of committee to look into it. Uh, you have God is the uncaused cause. Because everything has a cause, so uh, something, oops, something has to have a start. Why can't it be the super strength? Why does it have to be God? Well, I, I'm, I'm looking if I got the answer there for you. No, just hold on. I got to get to my uh, pages. Whoops. I think it's on this page. Uh, oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, I think I covered it in what I read about the first cause of, uh, uh, must be an independent of its effect. Uh, God must be transcendent, that is, above and beyond the boundaries of his creation. Uh, the, the second uh, cause was uh, there must be infinitely powerful. Powerful. The first cause has to be unlimited because if it were limited, it would have to be limited by some other things, and it cannot be limited by nothing. So uh, I, I don't know if that really answers uh, your argument, but uh, your question. You guys are. But uh, that's the best I can do. Excuse me, I have a question, <laughs> and that is, if strings are supposed to be parts of neutrons or protons, 
Uh, how are they omnipresent? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, I mean, uh, going back to my illustration on the handout, if, uh, if you look at, go back and consider the apple, the apple, uh, yeah. now this is according to string theorists, okay? The apple contains atoms. The atoms are made up of <coughs> electrons, protons, and neutrons. And then the, they have subparticles better known as quarks. And after quarks, you get to the strings. So, uh, the, so in other words, in, in the atomic structure, uh, there's a strong force of string theory that's holding the atoms together in the nucleus and in the electrons. That's the best answer I can give you. Whew. Does belief in string theory give us eternal life? <laughs> well, it, uh, yes. it uh, may get us rooted in uh, this world and we have an appreciation for being a part of this world. Okay. Uh, Don again and Wesley again. I, I, I don't know if somebody asked this question while I was in the band. What, what's, what is Ampere? I still don't have to watch it here in your lecture and, and, and watch the film. I'm still not real sure what Ampere is. Can you tell me real brief what that is? Or? Okay. All right, going back to the film, and I don't know if you remember the scene, uh, there were five different cellists. Playing. Yeah, uh, right, uh, right, right, right. And they were saying, you know, the, and the string, uh, the music was coming off in little strings, okay? Yes. All right, at one time, they, uh, they had five different theories of string theory. Okay. Okay. But that didn't sit well with the, uh, the physics community very well. Because... Okay. If you're trying to have a theory of everything, how could you have five different, uh, uh, I'll use bright and green term, flavors. Okay. All right. Then, <coughs> then what happened is then he jumped to a segment on uh, a fellow uh, by the name of Witten. Okay? okay. And Witten uh, was a guy that came out and in 1995, he was at the String 95 conference somewhere, I think, okay. out west, okay? And he shocked the whole community that was there. Okay. And he came up with the, basically what is now known as the M theory okay. of string theory. Okay. Now, uh, now, what it was, what he, what he did is he blew away four of the theories. Okay. And, he's, and, he, and, and what they said in the DVD was that the, the four theories were basically mirror images of the one. Oh, okay. And so he added that now he saw, now they were at ten dimensions. And then the way he got around that was he came up with the eleventh dimension, the brain. Oh. Oh, okay. And a brain could stretch the, the whole universe, it could cover this room, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it covers, it's, our dimension, it's dimensions could be infinite. Okay, got All right? Yeah. So then, that, so then, he, uh, I guess he called it a magical matrix. Okay. But some people weren't sure, you know, what he really called it. Okay. Some said murky. Some, someone said, really, M, what's his name, because uh, oh, it began it's with the letter W, down, it, w it was the M upside, upside down? Yeah. All right, does that clarify? Yeah, well, that's, that's oh, yeah. I understood the etymology, yeah. The, 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 yeah, I just didn't know okay, what, yeah. it was, that's, you know, that's, what the theory yeah. was. I still don't understand. Yeah, that. it's, uh, okay. but it's, uh, it's, it sets the stage for the brain. Oh, okay. Um, yes, membrane. Wesley, I got two questions. If yes. uh, a string is so small and you say it has two points of contact, what is it contacting? Uh, it well, seems like it would fall through whatever 
if it's so small. Right. Well, you know, it's like uh, you know, you're, you're uh, uh, like on the DVD here. You know, you, you have the two prongs, and you put them into the machine. You know, they connect. Yeah, but if it's so small, it would go through the machine. Well, I, I was just saying that in, in theory, though. It, uh, they can attach themselves uh, to the theoretical brain, you know. Well, the brain would be too small. I mean, well, it would be it, small. It, yeah, it's, it, 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 as far as, see these things, are, in, uh, in, ter like in terms of visibility. Oh, oh, oh my God. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't handle it, but anyway, let's kick it over here. I fell through another dimension. Thanks, sir. Uh, so, at any rate, so, 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 so at any rate, they're so small, they're not visible, and they're hypothetical, but from their equations and everything, that they figure that's the way they must work. Okay. My second question is, have you heard of what a, an equation is from start to finish? The explanation of an equation. So oh. to understand the ramifications of what they're talking about. Uh, that's out my, outside my expertise. I, I think I wanted to take a philosophical approach. I'm not a mathematician. Uh, I don't know if anybody here in this room is a mathematician. So uh, maybe uh, after... Uh, God the rebuttal period, uh, they can explain to you. I, I, okay. is you can, you can, you can rebuttal the start of a car to the ignition. Right. Or you can okay, I do know this from watching the video. Thank you. I do know this. That at one time, uh, they had what they call an anomaly in mathematics. So in other words, they were solving for x, and x had two different values. Okay? And they, they were, they were kind of hung up on your mathematical equations for a long time. And then two guys got together and they sat down and one Saturday afternoon, I guess, and kept crunching on these numbers or whatever. And they, and, and they had two different equations. And then the, in the end, the answers for both equations were, was the number 496. And they said, oh, we're, we're, uh, 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 string theory uh, is uh, live again. You know, we solved the anomaly. That's all I know. <laughs> Beyond that, <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's Charles? Yeah, I don't know, Doug, you had a little bit there about black holes, and I don't know if you can answer this, maybe somebody else can, but I, I understand that I... You can have a black hole in your head. I'm not talking about anyone here. That's not a personal attack. <laughs> Is that from <laughs> attempted suicide? Or? Yeah. I, I don't Do know you know if you, you can have one in your head? Well, I'll show you. <laughs> well, not for very long. Oh, right. <laughs> Well, I would say if you have a black hole, you cannot be enlightened. Oh, Let's go to rebuttals. Rebuttals. Any other questions? Rebuttals. No more questions. In that case, we will move on to our rebuttal period. Thank you. Thank you. Your own testimony. Thank you, Doug. You're welcome here. And uh, uh, we have assembled here our musical chairs, already occupied by two of them, by uh, Joe Mayer and Sid Cohen. Uh, you can come and join them. Uh, beginning on my right, that's probably your left. Uh, they will come to the microphone and address us, but I need to know how many people have something to say on the subject or, or on what's on their minds. Let's see, one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. About, about four minutes, Brown, oh, because of the others. Each. Yeah, at least five <laughs> minutes are allowed, but... Uh, There'll be more. Yeah, there will be more of you, I expect. Go to four right. minutes. Uh, beginning with Joe Mayer. So four right. minutes. Right. Speaker. Yeah. I want to thank our speaker uh, this evening for inspiring me to reaffirm my atheism. <laughs> <laughs> String theory is a misnomer. The word theory does not apply to these situations. The word hypotheses, it does. Uh, there's string hypotheses, there's super string hypotheses, and all of these things depend on experimental verification. A theory is a complete system of knowledge which is verified by experiment, which doesn't mean it can't be modified as other experiments uh, produce different results. Uh, whereas a hypothesis is an idea that's spun out of the head, the mathematical head of physicists and astrophysicists and religionists. Um, sorry, I don't mean to hurt you, Brown. <laughs> um, now, in, in the, uh, in the uh, NOVA presentation, which is outdated, by the way, um, they talked about gravitons. We learned today, some of us, that gravitons operate only at very small distance, something called the Planck distance, uh, which is 0 0.33 zeros and then a 1. So it's a very small distance. It's called the Planck distance in physics. Um, gravity, on the other hand, operates over very large distances, over the entire known universe, for example. Um, it is essential to string and superstring theory that the Higgs boson exists. Now, at the, the Tevatron in Batavia and at the CERN uh, accelerator in uh, Geneva, they've been trying to locate the, the Higgs boson. They have narrowed it down. Uh, the Higgs boson must have an energy between 115 giga electron volts and 129 giga electron volt, a very small area. Uh, and the, the, both the, uh, the Tevatron and Batavia and the CERN machine have the capacity to produce Higgs bosons, uh, but they haven't found them. And superstring and string theory de depend for their very existence on the existence of the Higgs boson. Um, popularizers like Brian Greene uh, simplify these things for the television audience. They simplify and confuse so that the story uh, can be uh, adopted for television and to, can influence people who would otherwise not be aware of these things. Uh, one of the things that our speaker referred to was the Judeo-Christian uh, theory of God. Uh, I think we have to modify that in terms of the Judeo-Islamo-Christian-Mormon and uh, Scientology theory of God, uh, because all of them have the same characteristics as God. They are unprovable. Dr. Laura still here? No, no. She no. Like, well, good. Because she don't like to hear this mother F this and S that and F that and MF this. And usually when I come to listen to something like this, that's what I end up doing because they don't insult my intelligence with stupid stuff. <laughs> now, I want to thank Doug for being the speaker that is able to be real. Now, Ed Farmer, I'm sorry, Ed Rio, spoke 
gave a good speech similar to yours, talking about certain things. And I told Ed at the time, I said, I like that speech. But some idiot will come up here, and they going to tell you all about size this, size that. Like it ain't no quasi-size. Like it ain't no charters in science. As though a man, because he got on a white jacket and somebody said that he's a size from MIT, that he got the goddamn answer. Give me a break, please. See, now I didn't use the F there, so if I was mad, I would. Now, if you heard of the Sophists, if you heard of Plato, you know that Plato was not a fan of the Sophists. And why? Because Plato said the Sophists, all he wanted to do is win the argument. But Socrates was seeking the truth. People, all you need is a vocabulary, a piece of paper, and you can tell a story. You can tell a story. What did you think Hazard did? Was any of that shit true? What do you think Homer, Dante, and Virgil, Dante gave us the three steps, gave us the purgatory, gave us paradise, gave us uh, the one you go to heaven, I don't forget, uh, whatever they, the budget went down there and gave us a picture of what hell looked like. None of that was true. This was poetry. What's wrong with it? Nothing. I've said it up here and i said it again. I love the poet. In fact, I love the philosopher. Then I got into the poets and I'm saying, man, these folks are heavy. And you know why I like them? Because they got ability to think. They are creators, and how can I not like them? But they, and the main reason I like them, he didn't go around claiming that he had some answer, and he had knowledge and some proof about uh, uh, Olympic and the gods that he created. Virgil didn't go out and, and tell people that, oh, I was out there for real. Now, folks, the speech was just like it's supposed to be. He said it, and I don't know why he hit these kind of questions that has nothing to do with it. He was saying right here, if you're not talking, that science at that level, when you're talking about theory, and talking about shit you can't prove, is the same as when you start to thump in the Bible. <laughs> now, if you want to believe in God, you won't believe in that, that's good. But you ain't got no proof of that. And you had good arguments. Do I have any problem with St. Quantus of Time? Uh, uh, St. Quantus, Asla, Augustine? No, I don't have no problem with them. Why? Because they were speaking intelligently. They didn't came with no proof. They were saying, this is one way we can say that God exists. St. Thomas said five ways. And St. Thomas, by the way, talking about the mover and the extra mover and so forth, all he was doing there was Aristotle. In fact, he made Aristotle famous with some of this bull stuff. Aristotle oh. talked about the first mover. And St. Thomas, 1,300 years later, was saying the same thing. Ain't nothing wrong with people being created. I love intelligence. I love everything. I just can't stand nobody telling me that some asshole on his way to Rose Hill got the answers. Uh, if we take the number one, take and we keep counting, we can count to infinity. There's no end to it. I don't care how much you count. Uh, if, you, if you take a lifetime in counting and you have somebody else counting, you can keep counting forever. Uh, we, we arbitrarily take the number one out of the infinite, out of the infinite. And so the world is actually uh, infinite. If we take number one, we go down into uh, micro, uh, into the micro world, nanoscience. We go down into infinity. There's no end to it. Uh, right now, our, our multi universes never seem to stop. It secretes time and space, which are forms of matter. 
Matter breaks down and forms space. Space breaks down and forms new matter. Matter always goes forward, never backward. Can't go backward. Only in somebody's mind does it go backward. If we start from A, we get A and B, and B and C are always contained in A. How do we prove this? Did anyone ever look at a clock? A clock always goes forward, never backward. If we could make a million, if he could prove that the clock goes backwards, somebody can make a million dollars or more. Uh, as far as black holes are concerned, the membrane contains, it's, it's like an encyclopedia. It contains all the knowledge of the universe. Just like our brain it contains all the knowledge of our lives. So, from our past. Uh, since that happens, what happens is that the membrane corresponds to the brain itself. So it's all inter interconnected and interdependent. We have an interconnected world that goes forward, never backward, and has an evolution to it. And that is, that is the uh, way it goes forward. I, I'm timing, Brom, don't worry. Right oh, good, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the God of our uh, Hebrew uh, Christian yeah. tradition is a God of who motivates, uh, who punishes and rewards, who creates, gives meaning to everything in the universe or in the universes, whatever you can imagine. Even if you can't imagine it, What the uh, uh, hypothesis of uh, string theories may give us, hypotheses, <laughs> is a really conjectural, but what the uh, theories of uh, that are expressed in scripture, uh, the, the pronouncements of the prophets, they were based on their, their understanding of what life is like, what it is to love and care, and what human beings are like. Uh, and they they are not empty conjectures. They are based on experience and on faith resulting from that experience, just as um, modern science may be. It's, modern science is experiential, and so too is a religion that is based on human life and experience uh, and uh, we share in that, in uh, the traditions of scripture and, uh, and even uh, the, uh, the philosophical adaptations uh, that were given. Uh, I mean, Doug has talked about uh, omnipotence and omniscience and, uh, and the, the philosophical attributes of uh, a God, uh, but those philosophical attributes by themselves are only indicators of what God is like. They're trying to approximate uh, 
with abstract theories or hypotheses of what was evidenced uh, and witnessed to in uh, the uh, Christian and uh, Hebrew scriptures. <coughs> uh, it's very different believing in life enough to pursue bravely the, your, your life uh, to really love, to really express the, the love of God that's, that's in you and uh, simply uh, conform to some uh, number of propositions uh, in your head. The, <laughs> two different things entirely. I'm talking about faith. Okay. Hi. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is Klingons. Uh, for, I want to talk about Klingons. If you're interested in Klingons, and I guess Christianity is maybe, the, for lack of a better word, uh, there is a play that happens every year in December. It's called The Klingon Christmas Carol. <laughs> it's happened five times. I imagine it'll happen another five times. It's a lot of fun. If you can get a chance, you can go see it. Uh, when uh, when I was younger, of course, I, I read um, Night by Elie Wiesel, and in it, he talks about being a that you're not supposed to study Kabbalah until you're 40, because once you hit 40, then you can handle it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to handle the mystical things that happen, and you can die. Uh, and so um, you, you may consider it ridiculous. Um, but there's a movie called Pi. It's, I think it was an independent film. And it, the production values aren't very good. You know, I don't presume to tell anybody that God exists or God doesn't exist, but I think it's, in this movie, Pi, I'll tell you the whole plot. It's not very interesting in terms of the plot. The plot is just that there's a guy who is trying to learn how to crack the stock market, and he's trying to come up with some mathematical formula. And he starts to go crazy as he gets closer to cracking the code. And... So I just always, throughout the whole movie, was asking myself the question, well, is it because he's just crazy? He's just going crazy because he's working himself to death? Or is, or is he getting close to some mystical thing? And, you know, again, I don't presume that anybody should believe one thing or the other, but I think it's interesting to ask the questions. Uh, super string theory, or string theory, uh, thank you, Doug, for your presentation, uh, is, you know, is so far beyond anything I could, I mean, what was shown up there, it's so far beyond anything I could imagine. Is It's so complicated. And, and that's supposed to be the simplification. I'm just sort of blown away. Uh, but I did hear a presentation several years ago uh, with Rocky Kolb and another person. And uh, I did learn, you know, that in terms of the universe, we're in Schauburg. And, <laughs> and also, uh, they talked about the different string theories, the different versions of it. And what they had mentioned was that the different <laughs> versions of it all solved a different mathematical problem, but created other mathematical problems, which is why they need, needed this M theory, apparently. And uh, I didn't know anything about M theory. So thank you again. And then I guess uh, I just have two more comments. One is that I don't think the bread analogy is very good. Because if the universe is expanding, which it is, and apparently our, the dark matter is expanding, and I assume that the dark matter is expanding in proportion to the rest of the universe expanding, uh, but then if we were a slice of bread and there was another slice of bread, I mean, there must be an awful lot of space in between if we're a slice of bread. Now, if we were a biscuit or something where we our, our dough would spill over into the other dough, maybe that would make more sense to me. And finally, uh, just about C.S. Lewis, who, you know, no one mentioned the, the three actual, the trilogy of the actual uh, science fiction 
books that he wrote. Uh, but you did mention the Chronicles of Narnia. I'm not sure in that in in those books whether he talked about a different universe or just a different world. I mean, it could have been a different planet or a different world. Yeah, it was magical. I don't know. All right, that's all. Thank you. All right. You know, I, I almost didn't come tonight, but actually I'm really glad I did because this, this is a really good presentation. You know, um, uh, a lot of our presentations, you know, here at the college have to have something to do with politics. Uh, but, but you know, I, I actually like it better when we have presentations on a variety of topics. This one really had little, if anything, to do with politics. And uh, it's more to do, well, it's really two subjects, really, science and religion. And I guess a little bit of philosophy thrown in as well. Um, but yeah, I thought this was a really good lecture. I mean, the subject matter was really good. There was a few technical difficulties. But in, in general, I thought it was it was really, and I learned a lot because to tell you the truth, now, I'm not I'm not a scientist. I think Joe probably knows a lot more about science than I do, and I think Doug Binkley back there. Oh, Doug's over here. Doug knows a lot more about science than I do, but um, but I learned a lot. And I'm just gonna say that you know most people don't learn anything about science after high school, uh, if they learned anything then, and and um, and so. If you went to high school before the 1990s, you wouldn't have learned about any of this stuff, um, you know, except by coming here. And uh, this is where I think the College of Complexes can serve a really valuable purpose in, in, in educating people and in, in exercising your brain, because it's been proven, actually, that the more thinking you do and the more learning new things that you do, uh, the less likely your chances are of getting Alzheimer's disease or, um, or, or, or senile dementia or other <laughs> brain diseases when you get older. Now. Uh, so this is this. So I consider this kind of a workout for the brain. By the way, I just the, the rebuttal period is really it's invaluable here. Right. Yeah, because Joe Meyer, Joe Meyer was you know he was right to point out that string theory is still hypothetical and and awaits confirmation from uh, from the CERN and Fermi Lab and the research that they're doing there. Now, if you listen real carefully to the film, uh, they use conditional words like may and stuff, but you really have to be paying attention. You know, but as far as what. Uh, as far as what Rhonda said about uh, how about how am I doing on time, Tim? You got you go, got two more minutes. Oh, okay. As far as what Rhonda was saying about the movie Pi, I saw the movie Pi as well, and um, I just want to say that first of all, the movie is, is sort of, as I understand it, it's sort of based on the ideas of the Bible Code or or Kabbalah. Is that correct? Do you know? If, is that true, Ron? Well, they put some Kab Kabbalah. Kabbalah uh, okay. Stuff in there. Yeah. All right. But in any case, but also some ideas about Bible Code. It's it's. Um, the movie, uh, most of the main characters in the movie are Jewish, and so the movie kind of presupposes that Judaism is, is, is the one true, the one religion that's actually true. Isn't it? Uh, okay, well, that, that's, that's, well, Chris, most people who aren't Jewish would probably disagree. They're entitled to. Yeah, that would, all right, all right. Now, uh, it, it is a very, it is a very interesting movie. It's actually very disturb. I watched a very disturbing movie, I mean, after I saw it, I mean, uh, it ends with the guy drilling a hole in his head. Yeah, yeah, let's not get into that. That's what I'm talking about. I, I don't want to build, blow the whole secret, but it, it is a very disturbing movie because the, uh, the now, as far as C.S. Lewis, you mentioned the trilogy. That trilogy, there was two book series that C.S. Lewis wrote in his efforts to try to promote uh, promote uh, Christian theology in a non in, in using using non Christian settings. One was the Chronicles of Narnia, which Rhonda mentioned, and I think Doug also mentioned. The other was a series that included the three books: Out of the Silent Planet, Perilandra, and That Hideous Strength. That was his science fiction trilogy. I did mention that nobody mentioned it. I've read right. it. Right. I just mentioned it now. Just that science fiction trilogy. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, but anyway, I just want to say a real good presentation, uh, and and uh, thanks for putting this on, Doug. Uh, and that's it. Yes, uh, my name is Doug Binkley, and I thank my uh, namesake Doug Bashir there for uh, putting this on. Um, if I had a little more courage, I might put on a presentation about um, uh, mathematical physics myself. But um, seeing as how um, um, I have stage fright a lot, uh, and I understand how that uh, goes, uh, I'll just mention a few things. Uh, uh, I appreciate um, uh, all of these uh, types of uh, um, uh, presentations where we delve into the uh, great uh, ideas. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, I rather jocularly asked them about whether uh, God might be a geek. Uh, obviously, nature or God, if God uh, 
created the universe uh, it, it involves very higher mathematics. So, uh, I myself uh, have a BS in physics from the Illinois Institute of Technology, which I received in 1975. At the time, I was studying general relativity, and I didn't actually uh, proceed to a PhD because I thought that just uh, meant piled higher and deeper. And uh, <laughs> it turned out that um, the uh, research that I was doing in general relativity had to do with uh, some very complicated uh, solutions to Einstein's field equations that actually had no physical utility whatsoever. BS They're, also has another meaning. Yeah, B, BS yeah, means bullshit. Uh, that, I have a BS degree, so I can bullshit uh, fairly easily, yeah, certainly for five minutes. Uh, but um, uh, the reason I didn't really get into uh, general relativity um, uh, as a lifestyle, uh, as a life uh, choice, was uh, because uh, uh, a lot of these um, physical theories or hypotheses, uh, they turn out to not actually have anything to do with the uh, real world. Uh, you have a whole lot of uh, solutions to Einstein's field equations that don't represent anything uh, physical. Uh, one that does uh, is the Schwarzschild uh, solution that's uh, supposed to be a static black hole, of course. Anyway, um, that's all beside the point. The superstring theory, of course, the super uh, to it means that uh, it's a supersymmetric theory meaning that uh, bosons and uh, fermions uh, can convert into one another uh, through group operation. Uh, now, um, the main thing, however, which uh, the other dog didn't get into, was that uh, superstring theory was supposed to solve uh, certain uh, problems with infinities that arose um, when you, have, um, you try to calculate uh, interactions between particles, uh, if they are point particles. And that's why, and he did describe how the uh, uh, use of the uh, uh, having them string so that they're not exactly point particles that uh, you could uh, get around these infinities. And um, Green, Schwartz uh, were the ones that popularized D-theory in 1984. They um, had that um, uh, breakthrough uh, with the mathematics. Uh, and then they published a book uh, in 1987 with Witten um, and um, the two volumes I have here, the problem that I have, and I'm rambling, of course, because um, you have to really prepare a uh, talk, like I said, uh, uh, to um, be able to really discuss this in depth. Uh, the problem I have, though, with, uh, with the uh, superstring theory is when you go and you find their string equation, and they're just using a um, um, string, they get a string equation which shows um, I can't even find it exactly here, but um, what it does is it, it's just uh, referring to a um, very tiny string. Uh, they make certain assumptions whereby they uh, get the tension of the string is huge, and uh, they uh, uh, use very technical reasons uh, getting rid of things like ghosts, which are uh, particles that aren't supposed to exist, uh, and they constrain um, the uh, mathematics and they come up with uh, an algebraic equation for the number of dimensions and in one theory there's like 10 dimensions it's just sol solving for this algebraic equation where it's set to zero to get rid of these ghosts or these anomalies or uh, uh, zero nor uh, uh, having only zero norm states um, but um, um, so you can have uh, d equals 10 or you can have d equals 26 in their versions and then later versions came up with D equals 11. Um, all these are sort of arbitrary because they're based on the assumptions you make, uh, which can be seen to be very quite, quite arbitrary when you go through the books. Uh, now, the real problem I have, as I must say, with the string equation is that it assumes that down to the very um, fundamental size, uh, as you approach a point, you know, in other words, going down even to like 10 to the minus 100 uh, meters, you're assuming the continuity of the mathematics of, of a, um, uh, the continuum, uh, uh, that you have the same number of points in, say, 10 to the minus 100 meters, same number of points there, an infinite number of points as you do in 10 to the minus 33 meters or, or, or a meter. And, uh, and what we really are going to need, probably, in order to actually come to a final theory, a theory of everything, is some kind of quantization of space-time itself. And there are people that have been working on this. Uh, Lee Smolin is one. Uh, Penrose uh, uh, worked for a while on it. Um, and so instead of just having the same kind of equation that used for an ordinary string, uh, which actually is an approximation, a string 
Uh, if you have a string, whether it's a rope string or whether it's a steel string, uh, it's made up of atoms. It actually is quantized. That string and the uh, mathematical solutions to that string are a, a, a simulation. They're an approximation. Um, because, of course, the string is made of atoms that are connected together. So your, your sine, sine wave um, uh, pattern or whatever uh, uh, Fourier transform you have of, uh, of a bunch of uh, vibrations added together, in which they go into right. it, show I'm that up. the uh, string can have actually vibrational modes. It goes left and right, superimposed on each other. Anyway, um, there were a whole lot of thing, more things I could have said. However, I'll just uh, accept the fact that my space... The time part of my space time uh, is run out. <laughs> Doug, I found your the scientific part of your talk of great interest, and I enjoyed it, and I thought you handled it very well. When you came relating that to your own particular th version of theology, I had a great deal of trouble with that. And I consider myself a religious person who goes to his synagogue once a week and who is, studies religious subjects, not just Judaism. And there I did not think that you made your case, and I didn't see any connection between the scientific part of your talk and the issue of religion. There I'm afraid to say, and Brian, you're our resident expert on the New Testament, so if I misquote this or ascribe it to the wrong gospel, don't hesitate to correct me. I believe this can be found in the gospel according to St. Luke. If my tongue become a sounding brass, and I become a, and, and I... Oh, it's the, the, uh, oh. That's in St. Paul. It's in the 13th chapter of... Uh, the, the first Corinthians. Thank you. Thank you. If my tongue become a sounding brass, and I have knowledge of all mysteries, well, that was. I'm afraid there were some mysteries that were not cleared up by their talk. <laughs> okay. Well, as as you can see, I'm wearing this hat which says, we'll get along fine as soon as you realize, I'm God. <laughs> I'm not God, but um, I'm a Sufi dervish, and Sufis are basic, basically Gnostics, which means they believe that through certain meditation exercises, you can contact the divine in some sense. Maybe not God, maybe an archangel or an angel or some higher being of some kind or another. So let me go into a meditation state so I can... Okay, there. I'm there already. Okay. So, uh, there's been a lot of numbers thrown around here tonight, so I want to tell you what these numbers are all about. First of all, what I want to know is why 11? The Jews say, the Lord my God, the Lord is one. Well, 11 may be the new number for describing God because one represents Father God in the sense of Father Time, and the other one represents the mother god in the sense of mother nature. And so the universe is the result of the synthesis between those two. Now, that's one way of looking at it. If dimensions are defined as degrees of freedom, how is degree being defined? In the same sense that there are 360 degrees in a circle? In the same sense in which there are degrees of temperature on a thermometer? Once again, the term degree is being thrown around and nobody's really defining it accurately enough. So, so let's get back to the numbers. I'm going to preface what I have to say about numbers and the way the human brain works with a little bit of something else. I go with the Kantian approach to God via the categorical imperative, which is the same as the golden rule, if you really read it carefully enough, what Kant was talking about. God is not approached through cognition alone, nor through blind action alone, but through ethics, which requires a balanced approach to those two. So where do numbers come in? Well, what brain scientists are beginning to find out is that one of the purposes of the subconscious brain is to keep track of how many times something happens. The subconscious brain does this for the conscious brain. Example, in this economy, 
and this job market, the unemployed conscious brain looks at its bank account and then looks at how that account is being reduced by food purchases and rent and then asks itself, how many times has it applied for a job without ever getting a call back? The subconscious brain has a finite number in it. And if that number is closely approached, the subconscious brain tells the conscious brain, okay, now you can start to get anxious. Now you can start to worry. As that number is still more closely approached, it says, okay, now you can get depressed. When that number is attained, it says, okay, now you can commit suicide. Your income is never going to exceed your outgo, is never going to approach your outgo. So there's no sense in living anymore. So that's the problem with the economy as we have it right now. So, so somebody threw the number 496 out. So let me tell you what that number really represents. There are four perfect numbers that are very easy to understand. Six, 28, 496 is one of them and 8,128. Perfect number is a number which is the sum of its divisors. Six can be divided by three, two, and one, which add up to six. 28 can be divided by 14, seven, two, four, and one, which add up to 28. 496 can be divided by 248, 124, 62, 31, two, four, eight, 16, and one. You add those all up together and you get 496. So I don't know what's going on there, but uh, Somebody came up with a perfect number. It's only the third perfect number. It's not the fourth perfect number. So, uh, so as a Sufi dervish, I, uh, I went into a meditation state, and I got a lot of little aphorisms. This happened about eight years ago. I got over 370 aphorisms, and I wrote them, down, wrote them all down in a little book. So I thought I'd read some of them for you here, because these are all aphorisms about science, mathematics, the cosmological approach to a definition of God, and they're also about ethics a little bit, too. So here's number one. Here's something nobody, nobody talked about. Antimatter. God hides inside antimatter. Mind dissipates into space while retaining its self-consciousness. Thus, it comes into control of more and more time through and by means of space. Information is incorporated into the fabric of space through mind. Life effervesces out of matter. Mind effervesces out of life. Mind imprints effervescence patterns on galactic foam. Now when I use the term galactic foam, there's another person you never mentioned, Margaret Geller. Margaret Geller is a, uh, 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 an astronomer and a cosmologist. She doesn't work with pencils and paper and numbers and theories and formulas all the time. She's actually, you know, looking through a telescope at what's going on out there. And she basically discovered that the universe has a large scale structure. It's foamy. So, you know, you quoted the guy, our world is a bubble on the ocean of existence, and there are many more like it. Well, what she basically discovered is that galaxies exist only on the surface of these bubbles. There are these huge spherical voids in the universe. We don't know what the purpose of them is yet. Well, to put it as simply as possible, those are where the angels and the archangels live. So that's what I'm getting at when I talk about, when I use some of these aphorisms. Mind dissipates into space while retaining its self-consciousness. Thus, it comes into control of more and more time through and by means of space. But ultimately, as a philosopher, this is my ultimate principle. All work creates some time, but only true work creates free time. I am stuck in a major quandary tonight because I think the example of string theory is a good one with a matter of perspective. Doug gave me a certain way of looking on how to divide a tape. 
and I one needed another to really make the presentation coherent. It's all a matter of perspective. But which perspective? Some of those work and some don't. There are some of us here who have the perspective of capitalism. Others who have the perspective of socialism. Some of us here know what works and some of us know what doesn't work, but thinks it works anyway. That sounds like bad matter. I am going to, to go out on a leap of faith tonight and say that I believe in capitalism. Why? Because there are certain claims that prove that it works. Same way that I'm a Christian. I can't prove the existence of God. I can't prove to you scientifically that he exists, but his claims can be. Much like Einstein's theory of relativity was uh, confirmed by the claims that it made with the bending of light around the sun. And the whole cornerstone of Christianity means about the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, which I happen to believe is an actual event. And I do believe that there is adequate scientific evidence to back it up. I will not get into that here, but there are always solutions to problems. And the hypothesis is usually where it starts when you want to try to get something to work. It was only a short 200 years ago that we were hypothesizing about the electric force, the electricity, with, Einst, with uh, Benjamin Franklin with the little key on the kite. It was just a few short years ago that Marconi and Tesla were talking about those invisible waves. Now, we've got cell phones that are operated basically by radio technology. And even, even just a few short years ago, when we were getting into computer theory and other items, particularly, particularly by other early adopters in the field, you know, the, the theory of packet switching, which now is the whole basis of the internet. The only way we really move forward is with a good science, with a good premise or a good uh, hypothesis. That hypothesis is proven, and that hypothesis, that proven hypothesis then yields tools to solve certain questions which lead to more certain questions. So what do you have? The cycle of, of innovation. You have a need or a, a, a quest. You innovate on that quest, and you make a little money by fulfilling that need or quest. Sounds like capitalism to me. I, I don't know where to go tonight. Let's begin by the usual. Let's thank Doug. I know he put in a lot of time and effort. He bought videos and all this and studied. And I've got to be gentle with the big guy. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, I'm not going to say too much tonight. Just a little bit about the Klingons. I'm not really much of a Trekkie. I, I think it's cool, but I understand the guy was raising his child and for the first several years of the child's life, he was speaking to it only in Klingon. <laughs> uh, um, the other thing about, oh, you mentioned Isaac Newton and the apple here. And I've always found it fascinating. Yes, the, he saw the apple fall to the earth. But if you really think about gravity, it's two bodies, the masses of two entities, and it, even though it, it appears to all of us that the apple is falling down to the earth, the earth itself is moving, perhaps just a minute fraction up towards the apple. Uh, it goes in both directions here. I've only heard two, two basic premises here tonight. One that um, well, the one that Brown here actually says, well, the Bible's based on experience and science is based on experience and therefore they're the same thing. <laughs> well, no, I'm sorry. 
Uh, I'm sorry, you had your shot, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> and science is a very structured experience called the experiment. Or if you like, test and measurement. And I don't know what the methodology was of so the guys who wrote the Bible. I have my own theory. But it was not with the structured the criteria that you approach uh, truth generated through the experiences of a laboratory. And there's simply not a valid comparison. The other one is basically armchair um, kind of theorizing. Also, I found it amazing since everything, there's no distinction between if it's experience, it's all true. Yeah. As a librarian, I made a fatal mistake of distinguishing works of fiction from works of nonfiction because they're both based on experiences. And therefore, some fiction book is identical to a history book, according to you guys. Now, I, you did have a cool premise here. That if you took the, if you want to know the basic tenets, we guess we could call it a string theory, and could we in fact find that these very same things were spoken of previously in the Bible? Yeah. I think that's a unique subject. Totally invalid. <laughs> <laughs> Infinitely intriguing. <laughs> the cosmology of the Bible. It begins uh, basically. Let's let's. One says got a big bang. One's got Adam and Eve. I don't know what Adam and Eve did, but it got them in a lot of trouble. Uh, things of this nature. Um, to say that one aspect of science. Actually, this is what he's saying. One very one area of science, a very narrow area of science, is in fact. Uh, arguments for and against the existence of God. Kind of intriguing. Uh, no, science has a process and this is a stage in its development. Um, and we can go on. The Bible is a static explanation of the universe. This other one sees our interim things. Are there, is there always going to be an unknown element in science? Of course. Does that prove that if, because there is an unknown aspect so there's an unknown aspect of science, therefore, uh, all sorts of theology is of the same because it's, it has it doesn't have the problem with theology. Bill is that there is no yardstick, there's no test to measurements, there's no verification, there's no process, <laughs> and whereas these guys do this this area of it may not. But if it's going to stand up, it's going to have to be verified and looked at. And the world is going to have to reflect this. If there's contradictions with it, it's going to be discarded, I assure you, instantaneously. But theology is just the opposite. It's, it's static and it's accepted. No, it's not. Okay. Anyhow, all right, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I think something can be done about those black well, holes you guys have. Since we got a little more time, uh, we uh, actually, when you talk about religion, you're talking about metaphysics and you're talking about idealism. And uh, I'm a materialist, and I look at things through a material existence. Now, if you uh, take religion, for instance, and you take early Christianity, we find that their idea of heaven was what the uh, aristocracy or the uh, people in Greece and Rome, the plutocrats, the way they lived was heaven. And if we look at the other aspect of it, the negative aspect of it, we find hell is a reflection of the way the slaves lived. So this is the way we got the idea of heaven and hell through our material existence. Now when the early Christians came to the United States, 
they try to convince the American Indians to believe in their God. And they told them, well, if you believe in our God, we're going to have a uh, high in the sky, so to speak. You go up to heaven uh, through the golden gate up the, uh, the stairway, and you're going to have all kinds of pleasures. You're going to, you're going to, uh, you're going to, you're going to uh, use the heart from now till eternity. You could do, you could rest from now till eternity. Everything will be perfect in heaven. But the Indians didn't uh, look upon heaven in that way. To them, heaven was uh, the, the happy hunting ground. To them, heaven was going out, uh, the Plain Indians, and shooting buffalo and bringing it back to their uh, families and using this buffalo for food, for skin, for making tents, for all kinds of material things. So the idea of God actually originates in the human mind because they can't understand causality. And once you understand causality, then you don't think of uh, God or anything of that nature, but you uh, look to science to, for explanations. And this is the only way you're going to ever uh, uh, make progress is to look to science. Science is constantly progressing, and nature itself is uh, conditioned to explain everything we know about the universe, and we have to study nature and how causality uh, exists in nature, and that's the way we're going to understand it. And we keep going forward in that, uh, in that way. Okay. Let the charge go. I'm an atheist. I am a... Yep. Arguing for the existence of God, if if they use apples and onions, they can defend God's existence with the same kind of enthusiasm that so kind of science apologists uh, defend Einstein. Einstein had never had a goddamn laboratory in his life. So how he tested the thing? He didn't need one. All right. Same way with anybody that wants to make up something about who behind the cloud. Now, what they call science, people like Charles, ain't got nothing to do with science. Taking Wren and figuring out this and figuring out that and making your, your work day easier ain't got a goddamn thing to do with science. That got something to do with common sense, and that's what a human being inherit when he became a human being. He can abstract, he can uh, contemplate, he can conceptualize, and he can put two and two together. Does that make him a scientist? Hell no, it doesn't make him a scientist. But if you want to use science as your religion, like a lot of people, then you can defend it, just like Charles and my man uh, uh, Cohen here. I'm saying, and I'm atheist, I'm saying, and I'm not defending, all I'm saying, I see the same thing. Now, if, 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 if you mix the on with proving the existence of God and being uh, 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 a duplicit, using a, a, a dual a way of argument, you could say things like, oh, the plane crashed and the little baby was saved. That's the work of God. Ah, uh, somebody could do the right thing and act right. Charles do the right thing. And you could say, that's proof for God. And you could read St. Thomas Aquinas, and they got five different things that can prove the work of God. Well, common sense tell you you can't accept that because it's not enough proof. Now tell me how somebody going to prove in a laboratory the Big Bang Theory. And that just one day. It's already been proved. It's already been proved. All right. Uh, Doug? Oh, Doug. Yes. 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 Yes.
Okay, um, time for my final comments or or whatever. <clears throat> First of all, I'd uh, like to express some thanks uh, to Ed for his kind words. Uh, about uh, his comments about uh, my talk tonight. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, checking out the library books, several of them, and looking at the video and trying to prepare my mind the uh, things I would be uh, saying uh, at the college. And um, uh, like I said, this is my fourth presentation, and uh, uh, I. Uh, <clears throat> this time it was a little rough because uh, we had the DVD and there, Charlie was saying that uh, it should do a uh, PowerPoint presentation, but uh, maybe, uh, I don't know how we could have, uh, Tim came uh, over to my house and worked with me on Tuesday, but I don't know how we could have uh, improved on that to make it run smoother, but uh, at least we had something for you folks. Uh, Doug Binkley, I want to thank you for uh, your insight into the math aspect of uh, string theory. Uh, the, I know uh, that the equations are very involved, very complicated. Uh, Doug and I uh, and uh, Bob uh, Lichtenbert have uh, been going on uh, Saturday mornings to the University of Chicago getting fully indoctrinated with all the uh, esoteric graphs and, and uh, formulas for uh, string theory and uh, gravity and things like that. Uh, we had a question on degrees of freedom. Uh, what kind of degrees are we talking about? Uh, my response uh, for that is, you know, it's, it's sort of a statistical uh, concept. Um, a lot of times, uh, when the uh, when you're applying a statistical formula, um, the degrees of freedom is one of the components that you have to know to to get the right uh, answer from the charts or, that you're working with. And um, so, uh, it, it's basically, I guess, a uh, freedom of movement. Uh, uh, of uh, direction or uh, uh, or of, of or having uh, freedom in analyzing the data that you're working with. Uh, Tim says there's always a, a solution to problems, but sometimes, uh, you know, uh, until you understand the problem, you can't come up with a solution. You have to fail sometimes. Well, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I know my dad used to say uh, necessity was the mother of invention, and uh, I think, uh, what was it, Ed Edison uh, said that you had to fail 999 times? He was looking uh, for the light bulb. He said he found 473 things that didn't work. Oh, yeah. Genius is 98, 2% inspiration and 98% perspiration. Yeah, but there was something about the failure, and that's what he was talking about. That's yeah. what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah, you find some things that don't work until you find the things that do work, and maybe that's what they're doing in string theory. And speaking about string theory uh, being a hypothesis, uh, I you can call it uh, that if you want, but uh, uh, in all the definitions, I got one here that I didn't use uh, from a book, Understanding the Universe. And it says, superstrings, a theory which supposes that a very small size, what appear to be point-like particles are in fact small oscillating strings. A theory containing this idea can successfully include gravity into the pantheon of known forces. And then it goes on, there is no experimental evidence 
to support or refute this idea. And I was thinking of mentioning this. Uh, uh, one of the one of the things I I took philosophy uh, epistemology class, and I I tried to find out the origin of this, but I think it goes back to the 19th century, so that'd be the 1800s. And I think uh, someone made the comment uh, that uh, uh, if the moon is green cheese, then I am a Chinaman, and I, and I guess. The only way you could disprove that it was to go to the moon and find out that the moon was not green cheese and then therefore he wouldn't be a Chinaman. But until you made that trip, this guy, whether you uh, agreed with him or not, would be a Chinaman. <laughs> and that sort of uh, what's going on with string theory, I guess, is that uh, until it can be refuted, it's, it's a theory. Uh, Charlie says theology is static. Uh, I, I would kind of disagree with him. Uh, I think uh, there, uh, there's always uh, among religious circles a rethinking of, you know, uh, reinterpretation of some of the things that have been quoted in scripture, some of the things that have been done by religious groups. Uh, so. I guess, you know, in a way that you could say uh, articles of faith maybe are static uh, within the churches. Even some churches change their uh, opinion. The Catholic Church is uh, very conservative. Uh, some other churches, the members vote, so I don't think, you know, their theology is always static. Um, but uh, at any rate, it is, it is like other things, always evolving and new new uh, interpretations, new ideas are uh, being uh, laid forth. Uh, I think I've uh, addressed everyone uh, that I had comments on. Oh, the other thing, I, I do have something for you atheists. And it's something I just had in my notes that I didn't use it. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> there is a book for you that's out there if you want to read it. And the title is uh, The God Theory. Uh, it's by Bernard Hash. Uh, I got the ISBN number. Some of the things that I, in the review that I have, I'm holding my hand. Topics they cover, how does consciousness arise from matter? Is there a God? Is there a compatible bridge between faith and science? Can the multiverse and superstring theories of cosmology be rendered consistent with an infinite intelligence? Does our consciousness transcend physical matter? These are just some of the questions the God theory attempts to answer. How do you spell his last name? Uh, H, yeah. Uh, H-A-I- that's like in Sam C H, and the first name was Bernard. And uh, it's, it, there's a comment here: Wiser Books. I think that could be the publisher. At any rate, uh, it's I got it off the internet, uh, Thank you. so I can share the ISBN number with you if you're interested. And uh, that concludes my rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you.